So welcome everybody to this um, future teacher um, webinar on rich media images. Uh, I'm the voice of Ron today because he's got a poorly throat. Get get well soon, Ron, even though he is here today. Um, so uh, for those who are new to the future teacher webinars, we do have a resource that usually accompanies the webinars. Um, we don't keep them as up to date in terms of the presentation resources that we used to do at the bottom. There's lots of rich resources in our <clears throat> Xerti object here. But what we do now is obviously add uh, the presenters, uh, their contact and any presentations uh, or websites that they share with us uh, on here. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you can feel free to kind of come in here and find out more about our presenters. Um, so what will happen today is we are actually going to start off with uh, Deb and Aaron from University of Nottingham. And I think, uh, Teresa, you no, let me think. Alistair. Is going I was to going to introduce just very briefly um, because they will. Uh, in their slides, there's a little bit about themselves anyway, but uh, I saw some lovely stuff, got in contact with Deb through uh, another colleague, some lovely use of images in uh, where you need multiple images together and you need to compare them and so on. I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder, so over to Aaron and Deb. They're going to share their screen and talk us through. <clears throat> That's great, I can see the screen. Great, thank you. You can hear me okay, Alistair? Indeed. Fabulous. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Deb Merrick. So um, today, myself and Aaron, we both teach anatomy at the University of Nottingham at, at different locate, at different sites. But um, we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we use Xerti to teach clinical imaging, so diagnostic imaging, and to teach anatomy to our students who are medical students before they enter into the clinical phase. Um, next slide, please, Aaron. So because of how we're going to describe things, I thought it might be useful just to quickly explain how we teach medicine or the sort of populations of students we have here at the University of Nottingham. Um, our undergraduates will do a five year course with us um, and actually they can either study at based in Nottingham or based at the Lincoln Medical School. Um, we also have a foundation year as well associated with both of those, which will be a six year course. So I'm involved in teaching the undergraduate medicine in Nottingham. Um, and we also have a four-year graduate entry medicine course, sometimes we refer to it as GEM, which is based over in Derby, and that's where Aaron's from. So just to give you a little bit of context about the variety of different students that we um, are involved in teaching and who study medicine at the University of Nottingham. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm involved in teaching the five-year programme. Um, our students get a BMed Sci, so they get a degree after three years, and then they go on into the clinical phase to get their full BMBS, so Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. So they spend three years with us, either in Nottingham or in Lincoln, and then they do a third year project, um, and then they, they qualify and get their BMEDS I. We do a case-based approach um, learning medicine in the early years here at Nottingham and in Lincoln. In Nottingham, we have about, cohorts are about 280 students, and then in Lincoln, we've got about 100 students at the moment. The graduate entry medicine um, degree is based in the Royal Derby Hospital for the first 18 months. And then our students combine with the students from Nottingham and they get clinical placements over the East Midlands. And there's about 110, 120 students. So we teach a lot of students either based in Nottingham, over in Derby or in Lincoln each year. Next slide, please, Aaron. So how do we teach anatomy? A variety of different ways. So we use human cadaveric material and the image on the slide is from the anatomy suite here at, at the University of Nottingham, based in Nottingham. So we either dissect or whether you're in Lincoln or Derby, you also use prosection. So that's pre-dissected ca cadaveric material. So we have lots of cadaveric material, but we use other resources as well. So we have lots of anatomical models. There's a model of the heart you can see in the center. We do surface anatomy osteology, lots of different resources. And we use primarily a small group teaching approach. Um, I have to say in Nottingham, we have lots of students. So our small groups are not quite as small as they will be in Lincoln or in Derby, but we facilitate them with um, anatomists like myself and Aaron and some clinicians. And we have 
quite clear um, workbooks and worksheets which accompany our teaching sessions. So we use this as a, a sort of a backdrop of some of the resources that we utilize. We can go to the next slide, please, Aaron. What we also do is we have to put our anatomy teaching sort of in clinical context. Um, we're, te we're teaching me medics, we're training our clinicians of the future. So we have to start very early in helping our students to interpret clin clinical imaging. So x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, for example. And a number of years ago, we started um, to try and digitalize how we do it. And it's certainly how it's done in the NHS now. So some of the images on the right-hand side of the screen you can see are um, from x-ray films that you can see students putting on light boxes. So we still do that in the anatomy suite, but we are aware that the days have gone by when a clinician will have a film and put it on a light box, it's all digital. So a number of years ago, we wanted to kind of capture that resource that students can have access to in the anatomy suite and put it online so that they can access it at their own time and throughout their course because their time in the anatomy suite is quite short compared to their, um, their sort of career and their, their learning um, with us over five or six years. So if we go to the next slide, um, so about 15 years ago, so it was quite a while ago, we started to put these images online into a resource and we published on it and, and the students really enjoyed it. We actually limited their use within the anatomy suite. So we put it online, but we kind of limited their use. But I think in the last sort of few years, particularly post COVID, when we've had to rethink how we teach anatomy a little bit, we have realized the importance of having access resources that they can access at their own time, but also a way that um, we can direct their learning and not just sort of, here's an adjunct, you can go and look at it if you want to. We've really made sure that we've incorporated it more fully into our teaching. And so we have spent a couple of years and I have to say, I can't really take credit for it. So um, Faye Cross, who Alistair alluded to, kind of put us in contact. She has done the bulk of redeveloping this package by using Xerthi. And now we have, we're in a position where we have quite a powerful Xerthi package, I think we believe. Um, we use it for medicine. We have an other degrees, so sports and exercise medicine here in Nottingham and the medical physiology and therapeutics over in Derby. So we, we have a huge body of students who are now utilizing this. But I'm going to pass it on to Aaron now, who's going to talk a little bit more about the logistics and how, how, we, how we've used it and the technology. Thank you very much, Deb. So Deb's done a great job to us sort of introducing the context and also just want to echo um, that Faye Cross was instrumental in developing the template that we used to, to create this. What I'm going to show you is just here um, in our anatomy suite at Derby, where I'm based um, on our Derby campus. Here is an example of part of our anatomy suite showing the resource itself on a display or a smart board alongside physical resources like skeletons, like what Deb previously showed in the presentation. So the idea being that we give them worksheets, in this case, our graduate entry medicine students. Here's an example of um, one of the sections from that worksheet, which is talking through some um, images in groups, small groups, about 68 students with links embedded into the workbook as well, that they can use then to access in their own time. And other things like more uh, pathological imaging, looking at examples of showing things like um, bleeds in the brain, stroke, that kind of thing. So that's just one small example then of how this looks in practice, really. From behind the scenes then, which of course I'm sure what we're all interested in, what we're doing as part of this template is using um, one of the page types called image sequences. So of course there are a number of different options that you can see here in the media drop down menu. Um, the one that was picked here that was chosen image sequence, this allows you to have a bit of flexibility in terms of the types of um, images that you can present and also just how many. So what I mean by that would be, for example, here we've got one that's um, showing you in Zerdi, the actual package itself, within that case uh, series. So we've got here, these files are showing um, from zero to 83, that's showing 83 of these JPEG files, which can then be combined into um, a slider view, almost like a series that could be scrolled through just for the mouse very intuitively. Alternatively, it can just be for a single image. There is the option, of course, in um, Zerdi to have just an image viewer, but this was chosen, I think, then to have a bit more flexibility between having multiple images or just one. And also you can loop the images. So to give you an example of what those look like, here we have a number of different chest x-rays. So with just having single images, you can line these up side by side using windows just here at the top, just to show one image perhaps, or two, or potentially more. So we've got three here side by side showing differences in 
the anatomy of the heart, where that would be in the chest in these three different people. Alternatively, then, you can have something like this, which would be showing a CT scan. And so this is a GIF file, it's just going by itself. But this is something that students and staff who are using this resource can then pause and play. They can also use this little bar here to scroll and to stop at different points to, to look more closely at the anatomy at different sections. As well, then there's a small micro, um, magnifier tool that you've got just here. And I'm not going to show it just now, but what it does, it can magnify a little bit some of the features that you can see in this, this file. So this is an example of an image sequence that's using a series of JPEG um, files. Here's something else that we can do, which is more to do with a 3D model in that sense. So this, is, of course, is still JPEGs, but it's showing you a rotation around the spine and the kidneys in this case. So an example of something that's a bit more um, to do with diagnostic imaging in this case. So looking at this, the structure of the, the kidneys and the tubes that are leading from the ureters. So we've got several of these. And again, there's an option here as part of image sequences to have a magnifier tool. What we also do is we actually have a separate program. So we've got one that's our imaging library that's, missed, that's mainly based around image sequences. And we've got one that instead is using a lot of labeled images called annotated diagrams. So that was where the image sequences were in the Zerdi package before in media. Here we've got this interactivity menu with annotated diagram at the very top. And so this gives you the option of adding in text labels, of highlighting sections of the image um, by, by using hotspots. But then it is possible through other tools in Zerdi to do that separately. I think it's just we, we chose this one because it lets you do those all together, essentially. So here's an example of what that can look like. Um, so this isn't what it looks like to the students or staff whenever they see it, but this is behind the scenes. Here we can see another chest x-ray and we see someone's collarbone or clavicle has been highlighted here in red. So essentially this is a hotspot and it means that whenever someone clicks on this part of the image or a drop down menu at the side, like what I'll show you in a second, they are able to get a bit more information on this or to show it on the image itself. And we'll, I'll show you an example of that just in a, a couple of seconds. Alternatively, then you can draw lines on the image to highlight structures, the course of them, like tubes, for example, here, like the airway, the trachea. And so what do these look like? Well, if we go behind the scenes, you can see as well that we can change the accessibility. So we can change the color, as you saw, it was red previously, highlighting the object or whatever it was, the feature. Uh, we can change that to other colors. We discussed amongst ourselves and decided that yellow would probably be the most accessible option. Blue is an option too. I'm certainly happy to receive any further feedback on and guidance on that. But essentially then this is just using a single image at this point, this annotated diagram with then some labels that we have added. And so you can see a version of that just here. So we can see where this section over here, these um, labels, trachea, parts of the airway, the bronchus are then highlighted on the image and the student or member of staff can go down this list and show those structures on this. You can also then toggle through different images using the arrows here at the bottom. So it's quite a versatile setup to people to look at these images and also make sense of them, especially if you're someone like a medical student who might not have the, the kind of knowledge of that early stage to interpret it confidently to help to build that knowledge. You can also do that with other types of x-rays like this, showing you here the knee. So we showed one of the chest. And again, very simply highlighting key structures, larger areas. And that's really everything then that I wanted to kind of show you just there. And again, lastly, to acknowledge the, these were the individuals are <clears throat> instrumental with helping to develop it. So Siobhan Lochner, Faye Cross and Dr. Tom Termazai at the NU, um, NU, NEH, uh, NHS uh, Trust. Thank you very much. That was excellent for timing and really enjoyed the, you know, the, the way you put together all the different content there. There's a lot of work gone into preparing that short presentation for us. So thank you very much for that. So if there are questions that people have, things they want to follow up, do put them in the text chat. We won't necessarily address them straight away because we're going on to our next speaker. We'll have a discussion bit at the end where we can pick those up. Um, and indeed, it may be that uh, Deb and Aaron would answer them in the text uh, before we even get to the discussion bit, but we'll leave that to you. So I am now going to hand over to Teresa, who's going to introduce Brian. Thank you, Alistair. I know Brian was in the process of moving to another room, so I just want to check, first of all, he's got how, there. <laughs> that, that he's there. <laughs> and... Uh, all is good so brian if you could um if you can hear me <laughs> maybe speak to us so uh, the logistics of getting in oh i think we might have a brian Aha, we have a brian wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. I'm so, uh, no no I'm so no sorry I've, I've um i've just been kicked out of the room that i, <laughs> that oh, <no>. I <laughs> 
are um, digital nomads, Brian. We can manage this. Yeah. Don't worry. We are, we, and we must. And we must. So I'm, I do apologize for any background noise that uh, um, that you that you get. But I also missed that last little bit. Did you introduce me? I haven't, you... I haven't yet, oh, haven't. but oh, I'm, very, okay. I'm very, very quickly going to say, this is Brian. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I met Brian through uh, the Association for Learning Technology because um, his work was, I think, very cleverly um, included as part of a strategy review within ALT. Um, and uh, certainly this is a visual leader. This is a person whose visual skills and his digital skills come together beautifully. And I've learned so much from, from Brian. I have to say, I'm five foot two, you know, on a good day. <laughs> so I do literally look up to Brian, who is very nearly seven foot tall. But that's just one of the many wonderful qualities. <laughs> Brian's going to tell you a little bit more about how his visual journey has led to uh, visual thinkery. So over to you, Brian, and I'm going to come back at the end of your session and just explain a little bit about why you're so important um, to me. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. That's very kind. Um, yeah, so I'm a little bit on the back foot, but I will do my best to uh, uh, to talk about all things visual. Um, the, the truth is that I, um, even though these days I masquerade as a cartoonist, um, uh, and as Teresa said, someone who's all things visual, um, I started life as a programmer and a technologist and uh, ran, I've run a couple of companies uh, to do with sort of learning technology, but I've always been curious. And it's my curiosity that's got me into trouble uh, on many, many an occasion. But um, this, the platform I'm going to show you today um, is something that I've built and it's, it's, it's built around my own curiosity, I guess. But it's the um, it's, it's built around being able to remix uh, an image um, because when I came across an, uh, an SVG, an SVG is a... Um, uh, a type of image that is is described as a document, right? So instead of pixels being laid out as uh, oh this pixel's blue, this pixel's red, this pixel's blue, you know in a, in a line describing an image, it's it's more a, a case of well this is a circle, and the circle has its center here, and and it's next to uh, a square, and so it's a it's a more descriptive sort of visual document, and I I was fascinated by well, what could I get that to do. Because with a little bit of web technology, uh, you can start to make those shapes move or you can start to make them changeable or make the color changeable. Um, and so that was the sort of the birth of what has now become uh, the, the, remixer, the remixer machine. And I'm just going to share my screen and show you what it is. Um, if I can remember how to do that. Right, here we go. Um, Okay, this is the yeah, this is the remixer machine. So, um, and there's a whole bunch of people remixing stuff all the time because it's an open platform. So you can come along and you can uh, grab a template and and, and remix it. Um, but I'm going to just jump into, um, let's see, one of there's quite a lot of them. Um, here's a really simple one, which is a, a an element in the periodic table. Okay. Um, and so the idea being that you can remix this element. So in fact, I'm going to uh, let's see. Hopefully, I've spelled curiosity right. And what was the 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 key to the universe? Is it 72, 74? Something I can't remember. 42. Anyway. 42, that's right. Frank. Showing your age there. Uh, so 42. <laughs> uh, and the idea being that then you can you could remix something. So let's, uh, in fact, let's go a little bit further and just change the background color here. Uh, because curiosity, what color does curiosity feel like? I'm not sure. Um, I'm just going to publish, publish that as a new remix. And if I look down here, I can see that lots of people have come before me and published various different uh, remixes of the same template. But there's something about remixing that I'm fascinated by. And it, it is, to remix it's, it is an expression of, of who you are. 
um, when, when different people get presented with the same canvas to remix, they'll go in lots of different directions. Um, and so, so almost a, a tool like this is asking you the question, well, what, what will you create? You know, which direction will you go in? Uh, so it becomes personal, you know, it becomes uh, um, maybe part of your identity, I don't know. But, um, you know, you see people experimenting with emoji or, um, or, or maybe they're trying to solve some other problem or they immediately go, oh, I could use this to, uh, you know, I'm talking about different types of e-learning, so I want to create a little periodic table of e-learning, you know. Um, and so I'm, I, I love facilitating that, I suppose. But this, this one was a really early one. But let me show you some of the other things that, that, have, have, um, uh, that I've, I've, I've got into remixing. Now, if I could just, uh, let's see, how do I move this panel at the top here? Um, so that I can. So another problem I had, um, was quite often whenever you're drawing, I do drawing every day really for clients. Um, and I'm, I'm in the business of ideas. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't care too much in terms of, um, you know, how things end up. Because uh, there's lots of ways to represent uh, an idea, I guess, or a lot of visual ways to represent an idea. What I'm interested in is the idea itself. What's the best way to communicate it to the audience you're trying to communicate it to? But quite often I find myself drawing you know, a particular part of the globe. Um, and so I thought, well, well could, it, could I create uh, a projection that I could then trace over, you know, if I, if I needed to? And um, I discovered that there was a whole uh, library already created that would, you know, allow you to sort of choose the projection that you, you, that you wish. Let's see, I quite like the Albers projection, but, you know, and that you could... Uh, you could zo maybe zoom in a little bit and that you could change the various different colors, you know. And you could, uh, you know, remove the, the, the um, graticules, as they're called, the graticules or the land borders. Um, and indeed, you know, creating different uh, projections that might be of use to whatever it is that people are are uh, are needing that for i've got no idea i know no idea what people need that sort of thing for um let me show you another one uh let's see thank you um this is more like a tool so i think this is one that <coughs> has used before as well it's a tool that uh allows you to think about um creating a, a credential um so in this case you know it, it might be the uh uh, the curious, curious badge. And it, it's, again, just helping you think through, well, you know, who issues this badge? Who earns this badge? Why do they, why does the person want it? Um, so just like a, a little visual representation of, um, of, of, a, of a process, of, of thinking through a process. And again, different people have come. I seem to have a lot of Polish visitors for some reason. Uh, Remix machine is big in Poland. Um, and I've got no idea why that is. Um, but again, a tool allowing people to, 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 to think and to share. And of course, you can, you can jump into something that someone has already created and start from there. You can't overwrite what they've created, but you can start from the, you know, where they left off and take it in a new direction, which is also the, the beauty of remixing. Um, let's see, uh, what, what have we got next? I've used the remix machine for, for badges. Um, so, so when I've designed badges for organizations, in this case, uh, the Association of Learning Technologists, um, ALT, um, the, you know, having a template that you can go in lots of different directions uh, becomes quite useful. So, you know, being able to change, um, you know, the, again, I can only really think of Curiosity, rewarding curiosity. That's a theme today. I, I, I don't think it's even spelt that way. Curi cur curiosity. Thank you. Um, but being able to just have enough control. So there's there's something in here about creative constraint where um, you you can only change certain things, certain parameters. But actually, because there are so many parameters, as in there's there's lots and lots of possibilities, I guess. Um, but but here is quite useful in that. And obviously, these are ones that I've created. Um, 
you know, they all fit with a similar aesthetic, but yet they mean slightly different things and they're maybe used for slightly different um, uh, sort of badging activities. Um, I've used these as, as a sort of a, uh, an identity card for conferences, especially during COVID when conferences were online. So allowing someone to remix their own conference pass. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's sort of saying, well, look, here's who I am. Um, you might recognize some of these people. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, conference a couple of years ago. Um, but there's something about sort of saying, well, here's a, here's a word that represents me. You know, here's the colors that, that I feel, you know, sort of go with me and my, and who I am or a picture or a drawing or, or my cat, you know, cats appear a lot in remixes, it seems. Um, and, uh, and then just lastly, I wanted to um, talk about one, uh, this, this is a, a custom remix that I built for the University of Göttingen in Germany. And, um, it allows people to sort of to, to go onto Google Maps and put in a latitude and longitude, you know what I mean, of a particular place. Um, or they could, they, you know, you, you can also just drag drag the map to a particular place. But it's, um, it's quite fun to, to get the exact location, I guess. And to, to upload a little photograph and to, to, you know, put in a comment next to that photograph. Um, and I built this for them. And then uh, my wife, who's a teacher, um, thought, well, could we use that for, um, for my year six students? Because we're exploring our shared, our, our, our heritage. Um, and we were based in London, so uh, very multi multicultural classes. Um, but used the remixer as a, as a way of looking at students' heritage a generation or two generations ago and seeing how rich it is, really. And just having one little, one little um, memory or one little sort of representation of that, and it, and it being a prompt for discussions. Anyway, you are very free to have a look at the remix machine yourself. It's it's it's, it's all open, um, and you can probably see that the uh, URL at the top there, remixer.visualthinkery.com. But uh, um, yeah. I, I, I suppose I just wanted to take you through some of those stories that almost the the um, the platform itself ha has allowed me to sort of to to keep remixing ideas uh, um, just in, in terms as 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 different things come along and different uh, uh, opportunities come along. Thank you. There's some wonderful stuff. So I, much, there's going to be a lot of time people are going to be spending on there, I think, after this. So, <laughs> Teresa, you are going to do a bit of a reflection. Is that right? Well, yeah, just just quickly to to sort of um, add a, a user's perspective, if you like, because when I first discovered the fabulous remixer machine, it was very much part of sort of going to conferences and designing badges, as, as Barry, uh, as Brian has already explained. Uh, and demonstrated and open badges because I'm an open practitioner also became uh, a focus and I, I think the point I want to make is that is the power of a template now Brian has mm. the knowledge to create these wonderful templates that mean that my total lack of of artistry gets put to one side because I can still end up with a gif or with a final image that i am really happy with and pleased with and i can take it away uh, and i can use my creative commons licensing share it alike um, so so what he's done is empowered me to produce um, images and to communicate things that are important to me in a different way and i've really witnessed the power of that communication being enhanced by that visual element so I, i've been in sessions where brian has facilitated conversations and he's sort of through sketch noting he's he's mapped those conversations and just having that visual image in front of us the conversations have gone deeper and further than they would otherwise have gone and we end up with something that summarizes them neatly and doesn't involve reading a, you know a lengthy paper I can quickly um, see those things and, and move on 
Um, so it was because of the power then of the remixer machine that I'd played with. And I think you do have to be brave enough to just dive in and click a few things. You can't break it. Um, have a go. Um, so I, I then decided to, to um, support Brian's work through Patreon. And I was reminded just the other day, I pay, I pay Brian probably the equivalent of a cup of coffee a year. So it's, it's kind of it's nowhere near enough and no way does it reflect the impact that I get from uh, supporting him and using the, the remixer machine uh, and having my own gallery, which enabled me to create an open badges um, template myself to use with people to whom uh, I'm uh, you know, trying to explain how to design an open badge. Um, I was reminded by a, a message, Haiku Deck sent me a message to thank me for paying them a ridiculous amount of money for a very small amount of, uh, of functionality. I was reminded by that just how good value I get from Brian's remixer. So fabulous tool, please, ex please um, do explore it, try it out, um, and ha has loads and loads of really useful um, impact on all its users. I have I have talked to people in Poland about it, so I hope <laughs> maybe that impact is coming back your way. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it. Sounds like it. Excellent. Thank you very much. So again, if you've got questions for Brian, there's some in there already. That's great. Keep questions coming in. We'll pick them up uh, later. And Lillian, were you going to introduce Matthew? I am. Well, no, uh, <laughs> nothing more to say except that our, our, our top and tail, um, Matt Deep Rose from Southampton, uh, a, a long time contributor to all good things, accessibility in the higher education sector. Uh, and I'll let him introduce his current work and his uh, sharing session. Thank you, Lillian. Um, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Yep, yep. Uh, showing well. Brilliant. So hi everyone, I'm Matthew Deeprose from the University of Southampton. My pronouns are he, him. I'm wearing glasses, black jacket, green shirt and matching green pocket square. Now, writing alternative text is an essential skill and writing alternative text for complex images can be a challenge. In the next 12 minutes, I'll reflect upon a session I prepared at University of Southampton on writing alternative text for images, charts and graphs. I'll explain the resources I used, the basic principles we shared, and the challenges that remain. You may also hear alternative text shortened to alt text. I'm likely to use these terms interchangeably because to me, they mean the same thing. It's the written description of an image that we write for those who do not see it or who want a text alternative of that image. And missing or poorly composed alternative text is one of the top accessibility issues affecting learning content at my university. While there's lots of guidance out there, often a quick Google search will return fairly basic guides that use simple images as examples. It can be more difficult to find advice around the more complex images we use in education and elsewhere. Writing good alternative text is really important. Many universities use systems such as Blackboard Ally or census access that provides students with alternative formats, such as an audio version. So good quality alternative text really helps students get the most out of alternative formats or who use assisted technologies such as screen readers. So back in May, I designed and ran a 30 minute session about writing alternative text for images, charts and graphs. We covered six examples from basic images to more complex ones like graphs, decision trees, and Venn diagrams. And I'll share a link to this resource at the end of this presentation. First, I want to highlight which resources were really useful for me in creating the session, because if you're not already aware of them, I think you'll find them very useful. Diagram Center has a really good YouTube video on describing complex images. And the Northwest Evaluation uh, Association, NWEA, has produced an incredible resource on writing alternative text for images that are used in assessments. How can you describe an image without giving away the answer? So that's an incredible resource if you write quizzes or assessments. And the POET training tool has exercises you can follow to learn more about writing alternative text. And if you've not come across that before, I highly recommend it. Previous resources were all freely available. This next resource is amazing, but has a cost from £400 a year for access for free users. 
Textbox Digital's described service provides guidance and worked examples of writing alternative text for different types of image. On screen, I'm listing the types of image they cover. Examples include diagrams, graphs, illustrations, maps, and scientific images such as circuit diagrams. I'm now showing a list of examples from the graph section. This includes area charts, box and whisker plots, and dot plots. When you select an image type, Described provides an overall set of guidance, a step-by-step -step process, and a worked example with a final complete description. This once you have a process you can follow, it really helps you to unlock what once might have been a mystery and can make it seem simple. In a moment, I'm going to go through one of the worked examples from our session. But first, are there any strategies or principles which apply whenever we are writing alternative text? Some high level strategies for all descriptions are to consider the context in which we use the image our intended audience and the function or purpose of that image. You might write different descriptions for the same image as the context, audience and function changes. For more complex images, a full description should include the title, the construction of the image, a summary or overview and a data table if relevant. Now I'm going to give a couple of extracts from the actual presentation. First, about how we attempted to explain the level of detail necessary, and then going through one of our worked examples. If you're sensitive to light or color changes, be aware that the next few slides use a much lighter theme. When we're writing descriptions for more complex images, like charts and graphs, how do we know how much text we should write? If I'm using the image for visual interest, then we'll mark it as decorative, so no alternate description. If the image or graph replicates text already in the document, then we should add a caption describing the essential content and context and use the alt text feature to mark the image as decorative. If the chart or graph supports or rationalizes what is in the text, then we should write a brief alternate text describing essentials of the image and use a caption or title. But if the chart or graph goes further than what is in the text, or I want students to use the graph or image in some way, then I should write a brief alternative text describing the essentials, add a caption, and then provide a full description elsewhere in the document. Ideally, I should also provide the tabular data that was used to generate the graph or chart. All descriptions should not go into the alternative text box. Why is that? First, the text boxes are usually quite small, sometimes are not spell checked, and most importantly, don't allow for semantic formatting like ordered lists, which are very important for describing some types of image. My understanding is that screen reader users cannot navigate alt text as, uh, added as an alt attribute in HTML or added using a tool like Office in the same way as other content. They can't skip through words or sentences. They either listen to it all or skip past it. And full descriptions can be useful for everyone, as we'll discover shortly. So in the full session, we looked at a complex line graph, a Venn diagram, and a decision tree or flowchart. I really recommend watching the full recording, a link to which I will post at the end. In a moment, we're going to look at the decision tree. So I'm using a simple decision tree that helps people who find kittens know what to do. And as an aside, finding suitable, simple Im image examples for these types of sessions can often be more of a challenge than you might expect. So I'm grateful to my colleague Tamsin Smith, who found this one for me. We can convert a flow chart into a linear list, giving a possible number of steps. Uh, we should state the construction that it's a flow chart and the number of actions. I don't need to describe what the lines look like, but I do need to describe the labels. In this case, yes and no. The pictures of the kittens are nice, but they're only used for decorative purposes. I don't need to describe them. So my full description starts with the title. I found kittens, now what? I then covered a construction of the image. Uh, this decision tree features seven main boxes and three decision points. Then I cover the steps. There are seven main boxes, so I'm using an ordered list with seven items. If a step ends in a decision point, then I use 
If yes, go to box X. If no, go to box Y. For example, one, one, box one. Do you see a mother cat in the area? If yes, go to box Box two, if no, go to box three. I won't go through reading the whole description, but I would point out that through using an ordered list, it's not only formatted in a more consistent way, the screen reader user can navigate through that ordered list much more efficiently than if I was using just plain text. On the next slide, I'm going back to my darker themed PowerPoint slides. When we've decided it's necessary, a full description is essential for those who do not see the image, or who use alternative formats or use assistive technologies. But they can be really useful for someone, for example, who experiences difficulties in concentrating on or navigating a graphic, such as that decision tree. They might prefer the text alternative. The full description can help anyone to confirm their understanding of the image. As with most aspects of accessibility, Whilst essential for some, they can be useful for all. So we've got to grips with how to write descriptions for complex images, and we have resources that we can use that explain how to do it. The question that remains for me is when we need to use full descriptions, where do we put them within the document, be it a Word document, PowerPoint presentation, or something else? And PowerPoints might be a particular challenge. We use Blackboard Ally, which doesn't use the speaker notes or hidden slides when generating an alternative format, quite rightly, but those would have been fairly obvious places to put a long description. One technique I've seen recommended is to put the full description in very small text and hide it off the slide or behind the image, but that would obscure that valuable full description from everyone apart from those using an audio alternative format or screen reader. The answer realistically is just to include it in full on however many pages or slides it requires and probably most importantly to tell students that you're doing this and explain the benefits for everyone. This is an ongoing journey. I'm interested to hear from those who use full descriptions within their materials and how they deal with their placement, particularly if you use Blackboard Ally. Thanks for listening. On screen is a link to that full presentation I mentioned and a QR code. The link is the go.soton, that's S O T O N, dot A C W K slash D L, which stands for digital learning, slash F T for future teacher. And I'll drop that link and all of the others that I've mentioned in the chat next. So thanks very much for listening. I think I hand over to um, Lillian. Indeed. Oh, that's really, really helpful advice and so clearly put. Um, and I think we all do need to uh, develop more sophisticated, shall we say, ways of using alt text and, and beginning to kind of understand it a little bit more. So I came across Matt's um, resources uh, that he used to develop training for staff at Southampton. And while I was working with my interns, uh, we were starting to look at things like charts, graphs, uh, and more mathematical images. Uh, how were we going to recommend to staff uh, what to do? So um, one of the links that I came across was through Matt uh, and certainly the NWEA uh, document that he recommended that's linked in his presentation was something that we highly valued. However, it's something like 126 pages long. It's absolutely brilliant. You can just jump to a particular section um, uh, what we did, though, was we created my my interns created a kind of primer uh, for the different kind of charts and graphs that we were dealing with and how we would describe them. Uh, and then we also kind of created some examples. So, you know, we created these kind of drawings that were previously hand drawn by colleagues. We, we turned them into digital um, images. And then we had a stab at creating uh, the description, <laughs> exactly as Matt said. And certainly we would not be adding that as alt text. It's too long. Uh, it's, it's a paragraph. Um, but we encourage our lecturers to um, uh, kind of caption or describe the image uh, in the text. Or you could create an appendix of all the images uh, with descriptions that someone could get to, as Matt says, even if they're not screen reader users, 
they may prefer to be talked through what they're looking at. Um, so yeah, um, thanks very much, Matt, for that wonderful um, uh, sharing of all your resources on your site. Um, and I think, you know, uh, this was something I wanted to kind of give back to Matt to let him know that his work had impacted other people uh, across the sector in terms of what we're doing as well. Okay, so um, something I forgot to mention at the beginning of the session uh, was the fact that the recording that we're making right now, it's going to be added uh, to the uh, future teacher page, um, which we will just link in the chat now. Um, and, and, and it will be added to our chat as well um, on, on this page. Um, but yeah, Teresa, uh, do you have, Teresa and Alistair, have you got a list of questions that we've collected from the meeting chat that we could use to launch our discussion? <clears throat> well, some questions, yeah, we certainly. Well, do you want to, have you got, do you want to start off? I've got some questions for um, Aaron and Deb, uh, as well as some for Brian. But uh, if you want to go first, Teresa. Um, well, yeah, I, I picked up the question for Aaron and Deb, I think the first one, which was all about um, medical schools and whether the resources they create are shared openly, which was an interesting point, I thought. So um, perhaps we could. Yeah, shall I take that? Um, yeah, thanks, see, Deborah. See what Aaron's take is. I don't think we're very good at doing stuff like that, if I'm being completely honest. So it's something that, you know, we've developed and because we have sites at Lincoln that's have started and Derby, we've spread it that far, but I don't think we're terribly good at sharing resources, which is in some respects a shame because anatomy <laughs> is anatomy and therefore it would be useful everywhere. Um, I think we're gonna showcase what we've done um, at the Anatomical Society. So we hope that there may be, we might develop it and push mm. it forward. I think it's where we would want to be, but we do find that most things are created in house and we tend to hold on to them when, when we shouldn't if I'm being completely honest sometimes with anatomy and depending on the resources there are uh, there's lots of um uh, legal requirements so some things we cannot share and we have to be really really careful not to if if anything you know if there's any patient detail or, or anything like that so I think we've been a bit cautious <clears throat> because of that in some respects but Aaron have you got anything to add Certainly, I think knowledge exchange is ever an issue with between academia and elsewhere. <laughs> um, so it's been brilliant today to chat to everyone and like, kind of demonstrate what we're doing. What I want to do is speak to some colleagues afterwards and see if we could come up with a shorter condensed version of this package that we can just vet with colleagues at the university mm. and then share with, with everyone today. Of course, the beauty of being in a Xerti format is that Xerti is a free and open source tool that others could build on and share back. Absolutely. Um, there was a, another question that I spotted, um, I think it was from Lillian, saying, uh, <clears throat> would you look at virtual reality uh, compared to Xerti? What, would it add anything or would, would there be barriers to using VR instead of using the approach you've developed? I can certainly feel this one, Deb. Um, so at the university, we have been working with 3D models to create um, mm. visualizations of things like osteology bones, that kind of thing. Um, it's quite difficult in Xerti to know where exactly, which feature, which type of page would be most appropriate <coughs> for it, because mm. these file types are so specialized, they're not just JPEGs. So um, I'm personally not that sure myself. I've had a look through all the different options, but I think um, I'm more than happy to collaborate with anyone on looking at some other potential templates, things like that. It'd be fantastic to do that. Okay, well, there's an offer for anybody out there uh, working in medical images. And then we had an interesting question for Brian, actually, which <laughs> because uh, the Brian's Brian obviously does work in the open, <clears throat> um, which was essentially, would you be able to provide a version of Remixer where um, perhaps for uh, for a fee, um, people could implement that. So sort of um, a, a private version to create images and then download, presumably. Yeah, that, that exists. Um, so the idea is you can have your own private gallery um, <laughs> because um, if you're doing a little warm up session and you want people to create a, a, an element in the periodic table, you don't necessarily want the world <laughs> being part of that. Um, so yeah, uh, essentially it's linked up to Patreon. So um if you yeah if you follow uh, our back patreon um or back me on patreon essentially then you get uh access to do, be able to do that um so yeah 
Great. And Thank there was a, there was there was a question for Brian also um, about can text to image artificial intelligence help? Is there any way of incorporating that with your work, or, or, or would it be valuable? Would it or not? Well, like I'm curious about all of these all of these things. That, you know, from a technology side as well as from a, from an artist's point of view. Um, and it's quite interesting. I find myself sort of sitting in the middle a little bit where. From an illustrator's point of view, there's a potential threat, you know, in terms of uh, hold on a minute. So you can't just dip into a, a you know a, a world of, of things that have already been painted and already been drawn and all and, and and then produced. But obviously, as humans, that's exactly what we do. You know, we're we're uh, we absorb stuff and we create things. So yeah. um, the fact that you know. A computer is doing it. Um, so there's a thread from the illustrator side, but also just from the, um, I'm in the business of ideas, you know, so quite often I'll find myself, um, you know, with, with a half-baked idea in my head and I'm like, what does that look like? And, you know, if I, have, I, haven't, if I haven't had enough coffee, I'm like, well, I'll, I'll ask AI what it thinks, you know, and, I, and, and so AI sort of gives me some options. And I'm, I'm always impressed. I, like, I'm always impressed by the technology, but it's never really what I'm after, you know, but yeah. it, it often does make me think in a different way. So I quite like mm. to use it like a... Um, like Stimulus a muse, tool. Like yeah. a muse yeah. and our, you know, uh, you know, just to see what I get back and to see if it gives me another little direction to go in. And um, so that's how I've used it so far. But uh, but yeah, the only worry I have is that yeah, obviously te technology tends to come first, and and the rules around the technology tend to come second. Yeah. yeah. And and therefore, there's often a, sh a, a bit of negotiation required there, and and uh, maybe a bit of pain as well. I don't know, but. I think that there was a really interesting post actually from Maha Bali just recently about care and um, you know the fact that your AI chatbot can generate a writer speech for you and you know what if you just use that and and uh, I mean her, her her take on it was very much well why do you not care enough to actually put your mind into that task and yeah. I, you know, when I look at the, the the huge talent of people like Brian and uh, you know other artists out there who I totally envy because I have no <sighs> artistic talent whatsoever I think you know there really needs to be um, there needs to be recognition of the human skill that goes into um, applying our minds <laughs> I think we so, then have some questions, Alistair, from, for um, Matt. We did. Um, I think Heather's was the one that I thought most um, most pressing for a number of people, which is how uh, ha have you got any tips, Matt, on how you convince the staff who are creating these amazing PowerPoints full of pictures and complex images? How do you convince them the value of taking the time to write the long text when they may say, oh, that'll take me hours. I haven't got time to do that. Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And I've got two half-baked ideas. <laughs> so um, one is what I mentioned about um, telling the students, for those who are, who, who are already convinced, and are doing it to be telling their students <coughs> loudly about why they're doing it and what the benefits are and how it, it benefits them. Sometimes you have to be told yeah. what, what the benefits are because <laughs> and I just know from other activities um, where, uh, where that have been slowly <laughs> rolled out across the university, you have um, students don't necessarily understand that Departments have different approaches. They, they say, I'm, I'm at the university. So then they say, well, I've got this on this module. Why don't I have it on that module? Mm. And so that can raise <clears throat> the, um, the pressure in one yeah. way. Although I know our academic colleagues are under a tremendous amount of weight of expectations from the university on all of the many things they have to do, particularly in research-focused universities. <laughs> the other is... Um, we have a annual virtual learning environment awards, uh, including a category for accessibility and inclusion. I think when you can recognize really good work, and we also have um, 
the uh, then then there, we have, we do a lot of big presentation. We record <laughs> the academics talking about the course that they built and why they did it in this way, and, and the interviews of the students and what they liked. That's can be much more powerful. That peer um, feedback compared with us just saying you should yeah, do this, yeah. but he hearing it from their <laughs> colleagues. Oh, I did this, and uh, my feedback was up. I got this award. Everything's awesome. <laughs> So I appreciate that. Maybe I'm making that sound over simple. <clears throat> um, that's how I would attempt to start answering that question at the moment. But could some of that be flipped on its head? So if you've got your annual VLE awards, could could it be that um, almost a, a disqualifier for applying for the award is that you don't have accessible content? Yes, I, I think that would be definitely something to consider. So. I'm afraid I've just come from the dark side. You're coming from the light side and I've come across from the dark side. Screw them down. <laughs> okay. Um, any other questions? Anything while we've been talking? That I just popped something in the chat uh, and it's kind of directed at, at Matt, but really I think it will work for Aaron and, and, and Deborah as well. Uh, and even Brian, you know, I, I often think that for lecturers who um, are saying it's 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 too much work to write all my alt text myself. There's always the choice, depending on what your images are, of searching the internet for the original source. Um, especially when it's art, art uh, collections and museums tend to have very good descriptions mm, nowadays, mm. and and actually using those um, available descriptions. But <laughs> where the image is something that requires you to engage with it uh, critically. Uh, I, I'm talking about, I don't know, statistical charts where you're trying to make inferences and stuff like that. And, and even uh, Aaron and, and Deborah, it's like uh, <clears throat> interpreting an X-ray image is quite a skill that you have to scaffold. So, you know, I, I almost think if you build in activities <clears throat> where students have to work in groups to describe an image, it is part of a really good critical uh, activity. And in describing that image, even if you have someone with vision impairment in the group and they're listening to that struggle of trying to find the, the accurate words, et cetera, that exercise is a really good group activity. And then the best kind of critical description could be used in your future resources, you know, as well. Any thoughts on that? <coughs> I particularly like that idea i think particularly for <coughs> those evergreen resources that are used from year to year um, we, we've also had some success with uh, employing groups of student interns to work on accessibility over the summer uh, and what i really loved about our work with our last group of interns is we kind of radicalized them they were still sending us messages saying oh, i found this like when when their work had finished say so i told them about this and <laughs> And I've been telling everyone else about it, so um, I think I mean that could definitely be um, be a good approach, as long as it's rewarded appropriately, either through assessment in the course, perhaps, or uh, formative activities in the course, or with like intern work that it would actually involve some some payment as well. So I'm just catching up with the messages here. I completely take on Mike's point there about Microsoft and AI creating automated image descriptions. I really do share Mike's kind of fear with that, that uh, in many cases you end up with a really poor description, which people look at and say, oh, yes, it is a picture of a duck and, <clears throat> and miss out all the really relevant relevant information it's uh yeah it's a, a good point and as kathy says it's not even good sometimes i've had some really peculiar th i think if you have anything that's vaguely interface related it says oh, image of an interface or a computer interface even though it might be all sorts of different things that just look vaguely like that um <clears throat> i think there was a point we, we discussed earlier around 
context and the importance of <clears throat> what are you trying to communicate <laughs> and actually bringing the critical faculties that human beings have and computers yeah. don't have so much i love the start did you see the um the point about at the start of lectures i asked my students to look at an image and describe it as a warm-up activity i think that's a that's a lovely idea there that would be a, a, a typical language sent language uh, lan language activity language teaching activity right too. Yeah, be very familiar with that. I, I did hear the word um, reward. I think Matt used that word reward, which <coughs> pinged in my brain to remind all our guest speakers today, you will be getting um, an open badge to recognize the effort that you've made in, in bringing your wonderful talents to, to bear today and uh, opening up this really lovely reflection on <coughs> use of uh, digital images so an open badge to recognize your guest pre presentership is on its way um, and i think what we're going to do is stop the recording yep. here so thank you very much to our presenters uh and um i've just popped in the chat a link to where the site uh, where the recording will go as well as the chat so i'll just stop recording here